some dare call it conspiracy. Welcome to Hashtag Conspiracy, also known as, some dare call it, The Hype Man. Today, we're going to dive into a topic that both of us get many questions about, and that is the political spectrum of conspiracy theories. Are conspiracy theorists more left-wing, or are they more right-wing? Are there specific conspiracy theories that align with the left, right, or center? Or is politics just two wings of the same bird? Joining us today to talk about exactly that is our Australian friend Sam from Alt Media Watch, an anti-fascist researcher covering the political fringes of society. Please follow Sam on Twitter at Alt Media Watch. Now let's explore the political spectrum of conspiracy theories. This is a topic, like it, some people would say it's it's an unfair label. Some people would say that it's a fair label. That's what we're going to find out and find out what these labels actually mean in the first place. But recently, there's been a lot of uh, leveling of accusations against particularly the alternative media of being either far right, having far right ideology, being influenced by the far right, or, or being manipulated by members of the far right, basically. And so we want to just see if this is a this is a fair criticism or not. Yeah. So what's your um, experience with this, Sam? I started, like a lot of people, I endured the lockdowns during COVID. And because of that, I saw a lot of um, online behavior that was kind of alarming. And I started monitoring that. And yeah, that's led me down this path. What sort of stuff did you see, Sam? Um, I mean, it began out as just like a lot of anti-vaccine misinformation and things like that. And then sort of as the pandemic lengthened, um, it just sort of went into a lot of like old school, you know, far right conspiracy topics. Jews? Were were Jews mentioned at all? (laughs) I mean, slowly it got more and more Jewish as the pandemic Mm. went on. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, th- this is the thing. Like, uh, you know, we're, we're going to look at sort of some sort of, some current conspiracy theories. We're going to look at the um, sort of classic conspiracy theories, and we're going to basically look at the definitions of of what what these sort of political ideas mean, basically. So, shall we just dive into it? Absolutely. Why not? Cool. Now, just to let people know, right? Okay, none of us. I mean, I don't know, Sam. You might be like, but we're not experts on politics. We haven't got a politics degree. We haven't got an international relations degree or anything like that. Basically, we're not Rain Man. We've we've pulled this from sort of resources all over the place. We've asked some people. We've done some research ourselves, which is always dangerous. And basically. With all of these categorizations, there's always nuance, okay? These aren't completely rigid. You'll get some things that are uh, considered left-wing that some right-wingers will be into. You'll get some sort of right-wing ideas that basically are favoured by left-wing people. You'll get, it's it's a spectrum or it's, 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 it's a sliding scale. I think none of this are monolith, though, you know. I think everybody is affected differently by this kind of thing. Yeah, completely, absolutely. This is the point. So we, we are going to be fairly broad because also within sort of all of these groups and stuff like that, there's, there's always offshoots and there's people that have various sort of, you know, even within sort of political parties themselves, look at, say, either the Republican Party or either the, the Labour Party, you've got various different sort of opinions of how left-wing, how centrist, what policy, uh, what policies uh, are likely, what what sort of things that they aspire to. Someone like Jeremy Corbyn is very, very different from uh, Keir Starmer. Someone like a Bernie Sanders is very different from a Hillary Clinton. And yet these are all sort of categorized uh, as, as left wing. And it's exactly the same on the, on the right wing. So we're going to try and sort of show the, the, the the scales of, of these sort of uh, political movements and what they kind of generally involve. And then we're going to see if we could apply any of this to uh, conspiracy theories. So, first thing, and I got this from a website called Politics 101. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not going to be the most advanced, uh, but essentially if we're talking about left-wing politics, so let's, let's talk about left-wing politics first. And so we're talking about either 
the uh, the Democrats in America or the Labour Party uh, in in the the UK or that type of that would be the political parties, but but generally, according to the interwebs, the left is characterised by an emphasis on ideas such as freedom, equality, fraternity, uh, human rights, progress, uh, reform, and it tends to be more favourable of sort of international relations as opposed to nationalism. Again, not all of these things are sacrosanct. Some people basically who are on the left will be sat there going, no, I don't agree with that at all. I hate fraternity or whatever. Fair enough. As I say, it's, it's a sliding scale. Now, here's the thing. I didn't know this. Brent knew this. Like, the origin of the phrases left wing and right wing came from the French Revolution. Um, and the so, the supporters of the revolution stood to the left of the king, whereas the people that supported the monarchy stood to the right of the king. And this is mm-hmm. this is where one of the sort of oldest conspiracy theories come from, the concept that the Illuminati caused the revolution against the French aristocrats and monarchs by infiltrating various um, Freemasonic lodges and church organisations, I think, to influence people. And this was the start of of that particular theory. I think it was a black Jack, gentleman called was it John Robeson was his name that wrote the book about it. Yeah, it was John John Robeson and Augustine Burwell. They were the two that wrote the same. They were the two that wrote the books about it at about a year within each other. Mm. Um, and this is basically the birth of the Freemason Illuminati uh, conspiracy theory that allegedly they birthed and drove the left. Yeah. And that kind of conspiracy theory does continue all the way through to today. So the conspiracy theory came from sort of conservative um, right wingers in the UK and, and various other places. And they felt that the only way that this uprising of workers, essentially that, you know, the normal working class people that became categorized as the left or the left wing, the only way that this was plausible was by some sort of massive plot, because essentially they'd been ticking along quite happily being in control of everything. And there was no indication that anything was going to go wrong. And so as, as a sort of an explanation for this, other than the fact that people were just sick to death of being sort of like oppressed, was that there must be some sort of plot. There must be some insidious movement behind the scenes that is motivating people to, to act in such a way. And, and as, as Brent says, this is where basically we get the start of the um, uh, Freemason slash Illuminati conspiracy theory regarding uh, the, the left wing. It transpires that none of it was true, or at the very least, like there's no evidence to support it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but that is essentially where um, where that starts. Now, going back to politics 101, um, it says that the left tends to look towards human reason to progress society through diversity, inclusive, inclusivity, and social reform. And by progress, what that means is that as opposed to a sort of more traditionalist idea of like the, the, everything's fine now or even that the past was better, which tends to be on the, the right wing, the left and this it has this idea of progressivism, which is basically the society is constantly moving forward, including more and more people bec- and altering itself to become better. Um, and whether that, that you think that's a, a good thing or a, a bad thing uh, is is entirely up to you. Now, Here's an interesting thing. Growing up, in my formative years, particularly in the UK, we had um, a Labour government. I mean, we went from a sort of a Tory government, Thatcher, to John Major. Uh, I think Ian Duncan Smith was in for a very brief time. But then we had the big Labour win of recent years, which was Tony Blair, and then lastly, Gordon Brown. And so you might think that, wow, you know, all this talk of freedom, equality, fraternity rights progress reform internationalism that must have been a wild old time that must have been brilliant and it wasn't because tony blair was crap (laughs) true yeah uh you know he did some dreadful things introducing um uh university fees making it more difficult for people to go to university like he started certain elements that that sort of led the slippery slope towards privatization of certain aspects of the National Health Service. Um, he was involved in essentially illegal wars, and some have accused him of war crimes. Now, <laughs> none of these 
things line up with the what would be the traditional on paper left-wing ideologies or political ideologies which just goes to show you that basically like although these frameworks exist often you know people within these things are not uh, as sam said these, these things aren't rigid and you know people can be at any side of the political spectrum and be not particularly nice people or they can be fabulous people basically so the idea if people are listening to this and going god these lefties are just gonna tell us how brilliant it is to be left like it's not that at all it, it, it really nah, isn't nah. That, that that at all it's um it's uh, th- this these valid criticisms of both sides of the political spectrum and these valid criticisms of all the players within these things, all the politicians. We we don't like the Clintons on this show. We don't like the Tony Blair government. We don't like... We kind of think... Personally, I thought Magic Grandpa was all right, but with with certain <laughs> by, by which I mean Jeremy Corbyn. But there was, but I didn't think he was. I thought he was the best option at the time. But I think that his stance on Europe was weak. I think his stance on certain other things were weak, and I think that he would have wouldn't have been the best leader. Uh, he, he certainly wasn't the. He wasn't the the, the sort of savior that was that was you know. Uh, Mm-hmm. That, that people sort of expressed, you know what I mean? He was as as flawed as anyone else. I still think that he was the best option at the time, and I still agree with a lot of his policies. I disagree with some of yeah. his policies, but but you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I was more in tune with his politics, but I also could see, like, the guy's not really a great leader because he's not, like, he's not tough enough. No. You know, he's not, like, the person that you want to be a manager in a place, but you want him to be your supervisor because, like, he's cool. Yeah. But you can't have him be the CEO because he's not, like, not hard enough to do that. Yeah, I, I, exactly right. A bit wishy-washy, a bit sort of like, you know, ineffectual. Some of his ideas I, I totally disagreed with. For example, like he he's, he was actually sort of pro-Brexit. And um, although Brexit tends to be a sort of right-wing thing, there's a huge amount of left-wing people that also wanted to be outside of Europe yeah. for, for whatever reason, basically. Yeah. So again, it, it isn't as, as clear uh, cut as, as it might be. What's the um, parallels in Australia, Sam? So currently we have a Labour government. They've just been elected. Um, we did have the – our right-wing government is called Liberals um, and they were in power for quite a long time before that. Um, and, I mean, everywhere is just turning to Labour at the moment because the Liberals just ruined the country is kind of like a bit of an overstretch, but, you know, like the – environment here is being destroyed we've had record bushfires record floods um and i think people are just sick of government inaction to be honest um but the issue is i don't know if it's the same for you guys but the labor party here most of those parties i can't really call them left anymore they're kind of just like center right um i don't know if labor's kind of the same for you guys in the uk but that's certainly here that it's just beholden to like liberal corporations, you know? Yeah. 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 When you say liberal, by the way, um, do you mean, is that the right wing party in, in, in Australia? Yeah. The lib, the libs. Yeah. Liberals. You see, this is another thing that we're going to discuss as well is the, the difference between all these phrases, liberal libertarianism and classical liberal, which we, we will come on to in a, in a minute, basically. But you're exactly right. Like we have a similar thing. Keith Starmer <laughs> is not a particularly left wing, um, left winger. He's, he's, he's very much to the center. In fact, you could make the argument that he's, he's, he's actually slightly towards the right in certain policies. He's certainly more keen with sort of, you know, corporations than, than he is uh, other things. Now, whether that's because, again like politics is a dirty game whether he's doing that because he he realizes that that makes him more likely to become the prime minister who can say but this is this is another thing you know when you have people abandoning their political principles in order to curry favor with either lobbyists or the general public yeah it it just becomes such a mishmash and like it, it it's 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 crazy basically well that's how people come disenfranchised with politics you know Absolutely. Yeah, totally. And, and and there's always that bounce, like like you said, people just they vote because they're sick of the current party. 
Like you tend to see that. I think that happens a bit more in America. You get this sort of vast swing from Republican to Democrat. So and so's in for a certain amount of time, rubbishes up the country, which allows the, the other person. Now, if you listen to a person like David Icke or whatever, that's always the plot. That's the plan, isn't it? To sort of like, you know, they'll make you disenfranchised and disappointed with these people until they move their next cult member in from the opposite side to sort of keep you constantly guessing and whatnot. Change is as good as a holiday, you know? Yeah, precisely. This is it. Like, now, often it doesn't turn out like that, but basically, yeah, people yearn for something different, don't they? And they'll, 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 they'll try it. Now, one thing that is specifically left-wing is that the left does actually favour an expanded role of government. Um, but by which, that doesn't mean like, oh, let's put cameras in everybody's house and so that like we can be monitored. It means an expanded role of government in regards to things like free medical treatment, free education, um, and unemployment benefits. Like the welfare state is a specifically left-wing thing that is, so certain right-wingers oppose it. The idea of a a social safety net essentially that that is there to to help the elderly the poor uh, and the disenfranchised essentially to ameliorate against certain problems like extreme poverty and 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 and, and such like that um the left also tends to favor higher tax rates particularly for the wealthy um and it uh, tends to favor government spending on social programs and infrastructure um so it, so it doesn't mind the exchange of of government control and money if they're doing the right thing with it like if they're basically building roads with it if they're you know making sure that education is 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 well done if they're making sure that people have access to health care and leisure facilities and uh, you know things that make their life better that's the point of the government and personally i'd agree with that like i don't want the government involved in my life at all except when they're supposed to provide services like education, like, um, you know, um, sweeping the roads, having the bins collected, like helping people out if they um, get ill or happen to be unable to work, that type of thing. I'm, I'm fully of the opinion that there's enough money in, in society to help everybody. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody else has to be poor. Yeah. Surely that's the point of the government, basically, like, you know, in emergencies or in, in just for general sort of running of society, that's where you want to be, basically. Like, it's, it's the other stuff that, that I don't want them to be involved in, basically. So, but, um, but yeah, um, I mean, one thing that, that tends to be sort of like ubiquitous uh, uh, across the left um, in all countries tends to be the idea that uh, access to free healthcare is a human right. It should be a universal and fundamental right that everybody should get access to to healthcare, um, which again, I, I tend to uh, agree with. Based. Sorry? Based. Based. <laughs> <laughs> now, they also, here's another thing that the left tends to agree with, not always. Um, I have some very left uh, lefty friends that don't agree with this, but they tend to support immigration, um, free movement between certain countries, and asylum seekers. Again, that's a very broad brush. There's some, and and that that's a lot to, to unpack there. Not always the case, but it tends to be that 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 sort of thing. And and there's also uh, a tendency towards being not opposed to abortion or stem cell research or or that type of thing. Um, again, not always the case, but but it tends to be a sort of more left wing. The, the left wing also tends to be more supportive of gay marriage, LGBT rights, and more opposed to discrimination against um, people based on minority status, sexuality, gender, uh, ethnic uh, ethnicity, uh, or race. Um, that that tends to be part of the sort of diversity inclusivity idea of the left they tend to favor gun control uh, now by gun control that doesn't mean that you're not allowed to have guns although some people would go that far um it, it runs again the scale from basically background checks waiting periods for guns etc 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 right up to some people that basically believe that there's no reason for guns at all in in society and again that's that's across the world i used to be in a gun club like I used to, to love shooting guns um, before um, 
before Dunblane happened. Uh, so I'm not opposed to guns in any way, um, in the same way that I'm not opposed to sort of like really souped up cars. But if you've got a really souped up car, you need to be insured on it and you need to make sure that you can control that car. And it's the same mm-hmm. thing with a gun. It's the same thing with a big dog. Like, do you know what I mean? No, to me, none of these things seem that terrifying, to be quite honest. Like, you know, you, you, if you're a gun owner or a car owner or whatever, you want to have things like insurance and um, safety aspects and stuff like that to make sure that basically other idiots don't ruin your hobby. And like, do you know what I mean? Smear yeah, your hobby. Yeah. Like, you know, oh, you're one of those gun people. You're irresponsible. No, not at all. Some people are. And, you know, personally, I'd be of the opinion of you'd want all those people to be not associated with you because, you know, it makes you look bad. Um, environment. The concern with the environment, um, and again, this is a, a sliding scale. Um, some people, are, um, you know, would would go so far as to be say vegan or whatever or to actually actively protest or to become activists for the environment some people just don't set fire to polar bears if you can help it like but it tends to be the left wing that are more concerned with environmental um uh, concerns to the point where they would um given a choice uh, economic activity, like say building a factory that would cause environmental harm, the left wing would be more inclined to say, well, don't build the factory. Whereas the right wing would be inclined to say, build the factory because it provides jobs and we can sort out the, we can sort out the environmental problems later, basically. So, so that would be uh, a distinction. Right. So here's, here's where we start to get into the thing because as, as Sam has just pointed out, liberal in Australia means right wing. Now in America and to a lesser extent England, liberal tends to mean left wing. Now, this has always confused the hell out of me because I've seen lots of people calling themselves liberals, but then these people that call themselves the classical liberals are railing against the liberal media or the liberal elite. And then you've got people who describe themselves as libertarianism or libertarians. And frankly, it confused the living hell out of me. And there is a very good reason for that, because it it doesn't kind of make sense. Liberalism is not to be confused with classical liberalism, because classical liberalism and liberalism are the complete opposite of one another, right? Classical liberalism is what would now be called libertarianism or it has a huge amount of similarities. It's not exactly the same, but a classical liberal is actually a libertarian. And we'll come on to why in in a bit. A liberal is not a libertarian. It's it's sort of the opposite. Now, uh, the ideology is that basically it promotes the protection of individual rights, equality, and opportunity against threats from both the state and from private actors, which means basically other people oppressing you and businesses oppressing you and that sort of thing. And liberalism holds that the role of the government is to protect and promote individual rights, equality, and autonomy. So liberalism has the government manage the economy, but with more social freedom. So so the, the concept of liberal in a modern sensibility is that basically it's fine to be gay it's fine to be black it's fine to be foreign it's fine to do whatever you want we're all inclusive if you want to do that that's fine and it doesn't bother me so that that would be what current liberal is and so this is why people rail against the liberal elite because they would feel that basically encouragement of certain things like drag shows homosexuality sexualization of children through sex education would be considered decadent and so they don't want it because again the right is sort of more traditionalist and so it doesn't really like that sort of thing whereas liberals aren't opposed to that type of thing at all basically they feel that it's just a part of society and that if people want to be exposed to that then that's entirely up to them because they don't feel that any of that is a bad thing so so that 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 is what a liberal is we'll come on to classical liberalism and libertarianism shortly but uh but that that's just it now as we get into sort of more extreme um left wing um the next sort of level of of left wing further away from the center would be what's called socialism now again this is a bit of a problematic 
term because it means different things to different people. Socialism in America is is interchangeable with the phrase communism, and they're not the same thing at all. But for whatever reason, in America, socialism and communism uh, are interchangeable, uh, and they're not the same thing. Socialism came about during the Industrial Revolution, and basically it, it seeks to prevent the exploitation of the workers by the capitalists. So what happened is all these massive factories and all these sort of like machines like the spinning Jeremy and all this were, were made sort of like for cotton mills and that type of thing, and mass industrialization, which meant mass workers. And all of a sudden, people realized that a lot of these workers are dying. A lot of these children workers are dying. A lot of them are not getting paid a lot. They're getting maimed by the machinery. They're getting, like, you know, the, the short end of the stick, so to speak. So people decided that, like, hang on, we want a society within capitalism, within the democratically elected government, but it provides social safety net. Um, and I Ideally, the economic state of the nation should benefit all of the citizens. So basically, you know, the wealthier people get, this This trickles down, essentially. Now, the, the important point about socialism is it exists within capitalism. Capitalism is buying stuff, selling stuff, commerce, that sort of things, like private-owned industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's perfectly happy to, to go along with that. You get the, the philosophy, for example, is, is uh, from from each according to his ability and to each according to his contribution so it's not equality across the board if you work hard you get paid more okay all it means it doesn't say socialism doesn't say that nobody can be rich it just says that nobody should be poor should be poor yeah yeah anybody can be wealthy anybody right okay if you put the effort in or even if you've got generational wealth or anything like that yeah, okay we've not gone full redistribution of the wealth yet they they just tend to think that there should be a social safety net and that workers should not be exploited they they believe that the economy should be run by a central government um individuals can own personal property um uh ideally in socialism Industrial capacity is communally owned, by which basically, like, you know, it is sort of the means of production back to the, the workers. It, what it would mean is, like, say if we had, like, a massive factory of English-built stuff, I don't know, whatever, birds custard, like, say that, right, okay, that's, that's the, the biggest selling product on the planet. It's, it's out doing Tesla. Um, ideally, in a socialist system, the profit from that that would basically trickle down into the country and benefit the workers and the country as a whole right it doesn't always happen in fact it never really happens to be quite honest but that's that's the idea um so uh and also within socialism class exists but there's less sort of differences um like it's it's more sort of everyone tends to be sort of a bit middle class basically or, or sort of like lower middle class but there is um possibility for uh getting wealthy now marx you may have heard of him not the bloke with the mustache and the uh the cigar the the, the wild white-haired bloke um karl marx he um felt that socialism was rubbish he felt that basically there's no way capitalists are going to give up some of their money and make it better for other people so there needs to be a violent revolution to seize the means of production from the wealthy and redistribute it among the poor and this is where communism works basically so the property and the resources and the means of the production are all owned by the state but everybody is the state essentially and so the philosophy would be from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs so essentially everybody gets gets the same um the production is intended to meet all basic human needs and it's distributed to the people at no charge all the economic resources are publicly owned and controlled by the government but you're not allowed personal property and this isn't always the case now there's no class and there's no religion in, in communism now this never works. It never, ever works. And it's appalling. It's totalitarian. Some people would call communism fascism, which isn't accurate because fascism is a specifically right-wing ideology. But it 
can be totalitarian. Basically, it goes through several stages, revolution, blah, 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 blah. The final stage is a utopia where everybody gets everything because society works um, brilliantly. But the, the, the stage before that is a dictator stage where somebody has to step up and take the reins of society to gear them towards this utopia. And what happens every single time is that they go, I'm not giving this up. Are you mad? I'm the dictator. I'm not giving it up. So Stalin, Ceausescu, Mao Zedong, all of these people, to a lesser extent, um, uh, Cuba, it never works. It always becomes dictatorial and results in a huge amounts of, of death. Also, once you get to be a dictator, you tend to go against your principles. For example, initially, homosexuality and abortion were legal in uh, Stalinist Russia. Later on, he changed that because once you're a dictator, you need to start persecuting people, essentially. Same thing with Ceausescu. Ceausescu outlawed abortion um, and homosexuality as well. Uh, although the these are considered to be, you know, left-wing things. Mm -hmm. So this idea that you would get of like, well, we discussed this in our show, this concept of cultural Marxism, like, pushing um, ideas of like, uh, you know, deviant sexuality and stuff like that. It doesn't make any sense on, on a number of reasons, which we discussed at length. One, there is no culture in Marxist society. Everything is geared towards the state, which means that basically everything about their culture is a celebration of the state. So if you're looking at things like punk rock, criticism of government, counterculture, all of that is a specifically capitalist venture. These things do not exist in Marxism. So for the concept of them to uh, export that, to undermine a capitalist society, it just uh, doesn't work, basically. Um, and the second and most important point is that um, basically all of that stuff doesn't fly in, in, in all of these communist dictatorships, particularly in Marxist dictatorships. So, so the concept is, uh, is just um, ridiculous. Right, so, so that, that is the extreme, uh, that is the, the sort of political spectrum of, of what we describe as, as the left wing. Now, are there any conspiracy theories that are specifically left wing? Yeah, th there's lots actually. Um, all of your sort of um, anti-world trade organisation, anti-corporate overreach, um, anti-drug wars, things like um, the shock doctrine by Naomi Klein, confessions of an economic hitman, um, the idea of uh, journalism as opposed to journalism that was uh, discussed in Flat Earth News, um, the concern about lobbyists. That brings up um, what we were saying also on Bohemian Grove, that, uh, that lady who was protesting them for so long. It's like she was a full-on lefty. Absolutely, yeah. Because she was talking about the lobbying and everything. The lobbying interest, yeah. Precisely. Like all this sort of anti-CIA stuff, anti-imperialism, anti-sort of like, you know, secret wars in other countries and stuff like that, that is traditionally left wing because it's, it's, it's opposed to sort of capitalist ventures, essentially. Um, so a lot of, um, of conspiracy theories are actually left wing. I think a lot of the anti-establishment kind of conspiracies um, come from a left wing Mm. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting one, right? Okay, the, um, the, the, the concerns that people have with the World Economic Forum, that, as we discussed on our podcast, so people should go and listen to that, it came from uh, a very right-wing source, the Heartlands Institute. So essentially, it's a right-wing conspiracy, but it's done in the style of a left-wing conspiracy because the whole point of it is it's a concern about corporate overreach. Um, it's, it's not that if you sort of like delve into it, but it's just a, an interesting point is that, that that is is sold very much through the prism of of like you say anti-establishment anti um you know anti-corruption anti-corporate left-wing ideology but actually bizarrely it's protecting uh figures um uh, in right-wing capitalistic think tanks but hey ho it is what it is so right-wing politics basically so and Again, this is not my words. This is taken from Politics 101, right? So, right. right. The right wing tends to view that certain social orders and hierarchies are inevitable, natural, normal, and desirable, and that inequality is actually the result of tradition or competitive markets. The right wing tends to be reactionary. 
Um, it looks towards individualism as opposed to collectivism. Basically, it says that each person rises or falls on their own merit. Um, it's not opposed to the retention of, of wealth, land, factory, property, or capital belonging entirely to its owners. In fact, it actually supports the idea of, of uh, an upper class, an upper owning class and uh, that basically make the decisions and a working class that do what they're told or do the work essentially they um support private industry they believe in private health care and private education and they, they feel that the quality of the health care or education that you should expect is dependent on your ability to pay um, they also, as I say, believe in a class system um, which has a ruling class um, that make the decisions and a working class that, that work. Now, they believe in free trade, low regulation, minimal government oversight, and that the market will control itself through performance, i.e., okay, the, the idea within the free market is that the best product will always rise to the top because the market demands that. Now, if we're honest, that never happens. Are Starbucks the best coffee in the world? No, but they're the most common. Why? Not because of the quality, okay, which is where the free market says that this is what will happen. Quality will rise because the market will go, that's the best. That's the one that we're going to pay for. It doesn't work like that, though, does it? Because basically, if you can do, say, for example, the Starbucks method, is is sort of very they work almost like a sort of virus like have you ever noticed that you'll say hang on there's a starbucks there and there's a starbucks there and there's a starbucks there and there's a starbucks there mcdonald's do the same thing with their franchises it's called oversaturation of the market basically if you can you can basically you choke the market with your product to the point where it, nobody can avoid it. Greg's Bakers, right? Okay, they're everywhere. Coca Cola. Yeah, yeah, exactly. These aren't necessarily the best products, but basically because they've got the marketing campaign behind them and they've got the money, they can dominate. And this is where basically, like, the free market concept falls down essentially. But let's not get bogged down with that, right? So the right wing tends to have a conservative, traditional, nationalistic outlook. Again, not all, not all, but but this is what it tends to be. Now, by conservative, it tends to me like this is the way that the world is. We don't like sort of new things. We like tradition. We like the sort of, um, you know, the family unit, 2.4, possibly tend to be more religious, not always. Um, and um, they believe more in... Uh, the nation, like they're very, you know, patriotic um, and don't necessarily want to be involved with internationalism in as much as, say, things like um, the EU. I'd sooner be an island than part of Europe, so to speak. Again, not always the case, but this this is what, what it sort of tends to be towards. Um, the right wing favours low tax and they favour less regulation on business. Um, they prefer reduced government spending, um, basically, they don't think they, they don't always agree with the welfare state. Now, again, if if you wanted to be critical, you could say, well, they they tend to like you know they don't mind government spending when it comes to bailing out large business or bailing out banks. Yeah, the welfare state's okay then, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Or or when you're financing wars or basically going over to other countries to steal resources or something like that, then they're not they're not really that bothered. Now. Again, they oppose what's called big government, which basically means that they don't want government involved in their life in any way, really. Unless, of course, you're black or gay or um, want an abortion or anything like that, in which case they do want government to impose certain regulations, so to speak. Like, you're not allowed to get married. <laughs> you, you've got to carry that child to term. You're not allowed to speak to my children. That that sort of thing, which some might say was a contradiction. But, like, but again, let's not get bogged down. Like, okay. the, the right wing tends to oppose free health care uh, provided by government, uh, and it tends to uh, prefer private health care or insurance-based health care. Um, it, not always, but the right wing does tend to be anti-immigration. 
They believe in homeschooling and private education and often think that basically both of these things should be subsidized by the government. That tends to be a more American thing. But but again, th- th- this is a thing. Not always by any stretch of the imagination, but the right wing tends to be opposed to gay marriage and anti-LGBT rights. Not always by any stretch of the imagination, but but particularly in this sort of culture wars, American traditional family values type argument, that is essentially where it comes from. Um, They're opposed to gun control because they see this as tyrannical. They see this as basically overreach of the government. Um, They're more permissive of industrial damage to the environment uh, because they believe... Now, here's something that I didn't realise. It's not that they hate the environment per se, Okay, it's just that they feel that the free market will eventually solve all problems. So, which is kind of like interesting. It's a bit, a bit like the geoengineering argument that we're going to do discuss in our chemtrails thing. Like, don't worry about global warming. There's stuff that we can do in the future that might be massively radical or whatever, blocking out the sun or whatever, something like that. But solutions will present themselves because we're we're great. Is, is the idea essentially so it's not as like they don't care so to speak it's just that they're very confident that, that, that the problems will get solved down the road now is that silly who knows but but that that's the the idea uh, the right wing tends to be and again this is not ubiquitous but it, they tend to be anti-abortion and opposed to sex education for the very young um they are pro freedom of speech and they're pro freedom of expression again unless you're black or gay or foreign or or anything like that then they don't particularly like you expressing yourself but but like you know let's not get bogged down in in hypocrisies um the right wing also justifies a traditional hierarchy based on the idea of natural law um and it tends to reject progressive ideas now what natural law means in this sense is that basically like it's almost like social darwinism the idea that basically like the 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 cream will rise to the top essentially Mm -hmm. like might is right yeah yeah basically which if people don't know like let me just quickly say that is a tenant of satanism is it (laughs) yes yes it is actually isn't it that's actually it might is right then now you start going into the social darwinism and all that sort of stuff it does start to tend to uh align with anton levey's politics just putting that out there for people (laughs) well i mean yeah (laughs) but anywho like so The right, again, and this isn't always the right, but they often use popularism, which is basically the concept of a distrust of the liberal elite by appealing to the reactionary mass, suggesting existential threats. Now, this is like essentially what popularism means is preaching to the sort of the mob, the mass, like, okay. Uh, And um, that's not always just on the right. You were saying as well, Corbyn did this Mm -hmm. on the left. Uh, and basically, you know, there's always that appeal to the working man, like, you know, but but with with the right wing, it tends to be uh, about a threat. Uh, uh, you know, they want to provoke a reaction. The, 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 the right is is traditionally reactionary. And so they'll say, you know, all oh, these experts are saying this. But what the truth is that you can see, you you know, you're not blind. You don't trust these experts. That That's the kind of populism. Examples of this would be. Donald Trump, like he's, the, he's exactly what 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 he is, you know, appealing to the masses. Don't trust the experts. Listen to me, uh, and, uh, and and all of that. Um, now, once you get a bit further away from that, you get what's called the radical right. Now, the radical right is basically just a more extreme version of the right, not quite far right, but it, it's it's radical, and that would be the Reagan administration, the John Birch Society. Um, and uh, the Thatcher government, okay? And so these are very, very traditional, very nearly authoritarian, very anti-communist, very sort of business first, sod the working class, pull yourself up by your bootstraps type of idea. Now, some people might have noticed that, hang on, all this pull yourself up by your bootstraps and blah, 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 and natural hierarchies and stuff like that. Doesn't that tend to favour people that are born into like vast amounts of wealth? And yes, yes, it does. 
in the same way that the left wing tends to favor people who aren't born into massive amounts of wealth. In fact, you could even, like, that that's sort of the point. The left wing is there to sort of help the workers and drag them up, whereas the right wing, you could make the argument, is there to support, the, again, through their own words, these nat- natural hierarchies that they feel are desirable and essentially keeps the class system in place. This isn't radical. This is exactly the point of why socialism and Marxism exist because capitalism exists with a class structure, toffs at the top, plebs at the bottom, and uh, everybody in the in the uh, in the crab bucket in the middle stabbing each other in the back. So, so that that isn't uh, hugely. Um, Hugely uh, uh, controversial of me to say, to be quite honest. So, libertarianism. Libertarianism is this concept that we see that, that is sometimes calls, called themselves classical liberals. And this is where the, the confusion comes from. And, and, and I'll tell you for why now. Because classical liberalism and libertarianism are almost identical. Classical liberalism came from a time in the 1800s where it was a counter to the authority um, of um, of the church and state at the time people had barely any rights essentially and so the classical concept of classical liberalism was essentially they don't want to be um uh they don't want to be oppressed by the state later when people started getting rights liberalism actually wanted the state involved but with, but to to create this equality whereas libertarianism doesn't want the state. They regard the state as the primary threat to individual freedom, and they advocate limiting its powers to those necessary to protect basic rights against interference from others. Okay, so libertarianism is the the ideology of individual liberty as its central concern, and it holds that the role of the government is only to protect individual liberty. Um, that conservatism, which is kind of the same, basically wants the government to uphold traditional social norms, but allowing economic freedoms and the free market with it. So basically, they want government to basically keep everything the same, but not be involved in their life uh, at all. Uh, and libertarianism states that individuals basically should be left alone by the government, and that personal responsibility is the key to success. And it's opposed to government overreach, and it's also completely opposed to the welfare state. And again, this this isn't necessarily Necessarily, like it, like that doesn't qualify everybody on the right, but that is what the term libertarianism means. Now, again, you could point out the irony that they're basically right. So they don't want government involved in them, but they're not concerned about again lobbying organizations and corporatism and that type of thing like the, this doesn't concern them now you could make the argument because essentially most of the people that are involved in that either are in that that demographic or aspire to be in that demographic or have been convinced that they could become that demographic because a lot of people might have noticed that basically like well surely the left wing is for the working class and the right wing is for the upper class why do so many people in the working class vote for right wing? Well, there's a number of reasons. One, because basically the right wing can appeal to them on a sort of political or ideological sense. Or two, because basically it gives you the impression, the left wing just like, gives you the impression that basically we can all get equal. The right wing gives you the impression that you can cross the board, the chessboard, so to speak. The pawn can become the queen. Um, they wouldn't want that. <laughs> that, that's, that, that, that's all right. The pawn can become a king. We'll say that, right? So, so that's why it tends to appeal to to that sort of thing. Like, but this is this is one again the, the sort of paradoxes. This is why people on the left wing don't understand why people on the right wing would working class people vote for the conservatives are pro monarchy that type of thing. But those people on the right wing can't understand why the left wing are concerned with. Why are you paying for all of these deviants and blah, 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 and all this thing? Just stop being a do-gooder and get on with your own life. So that's the perspective from either side. I'm not saying either is right or wrong. They're just a thing. They're valid opinions, aren't they? People are allowed to have their own opinions. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, as we say, like it is, it's a sliding scale, and, and, and people will have some left-wing views and some right-wing views, basically. However... When we get to the far right, now the far right uh, or the extreme right um, tends to be um, anti-democracy, ultra-nationalistic, racist and xenophobic, and it it has the concept of a strong state. So basically, 
They believe that society is a complete organism, the far right do, which is why they don't like immigration, they don't like gay people, they don't like black people, because they, they see society as a big hole, big white hole, right, okay? And essentially they see these as like a disease, an attack on society that is going to drag society down uh, and, and make it less pure. And this is why there's... Within the far right, there's this concept of us and them. The, the the use of the word they, the vague they, is is a definite far right thing, basically, uh, and it's there to sow division. That is almost entirely the point of of the, the, of that action. Um, the far right preaches an ideal utopia that would, would exist if only society was closed off to these existential threats. And they feel that they are the only sane and natural people in a society that is in perpetual decay caused by deviant others, essentially. Uh, they also believe in a golden age uh, and that they are constantly in this battle against this decadence. Um, they tend to be xenophobic. They tend to be racist. They tend to be chauvinistic, reactionary, and populist. They often apply social Darwinism to extol ideas of racial superiority, and they can include white supremacists, Nazis, neo-Nazis, radical right, alt-right, fascists, neo-fascists. Again, there's a whole sort of range of people in there someone in say the kkk might not necessarily get on with somebody from the english democrats or uh patriotic alternative or whatever right okay like but but there, there tends to be like with all of these things although there's a there's a spectrum a sliding scale there are certain catchments that make you far right and certain overlaps yeah, yeah, there's lots of overlap. Okay, but if you were to accuse somebody to being far right, it's anti-democracy, ultranationalism, racism, and the concept of a strong state. But any of these ideas of the state as a whole being eroded by deviancy, so Black Lives Matter, if you're opposed to Black Lives Matter, that is a far right argument that black lives matter are reducing the quality of society all of these arguments against drag queens um uh, um, uh doing stories to children uh, associating them and conflating them with pedophilia or grooming that is a far right tactic and it's it, and it's a, it, it's blatantly far right because again they're they're showing this decadence as a as an example of social decay they're massively hyping up what the, the consequences of this are, and they're basically presenting it in a way that they are the only sane ones fighting against this existential threat. And so this is where we're starting to look at, at things and basically, okay, some of these things, some of the language that's used is definitely starting to look a little bit far right. Not all, because we've just listed a dozen conspiracy theories that are specifically left wing, but Let's let's start to get into it. First, though, what we need to do is we need to understand what fascism is and the distinction between fascism um, and um, uh, and the far right. Now, fascism is a political ideology that emphasizes extreme nationalism, militarism, and the supremacy of the nation and the powerful leader over the individual. Now, if some people are going, what, like Donald Trump? Yeah, exactly like Donald Trump. What, like Ronald <laughs> Reagan? Yeah, exactly yeah. like Ronald Reagan. What, like Margaret Thatcher? Yes, exactly like Margaret Thatcher. These are all fascists, extreme nationalists who use the military and the supremacy of the nation behind the idea of a powerful leader. I think we, um, we have to acknowledge that fascism has changed a lot since then and mm. it's not really coming from state-based um, just from state-based people anymore. No, I mean, no. there's lots that are fascist that don't have the power of military or the power of the state that operate as well. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, these are also just like, you know, bullet points that, that sort of tend to, to lead. You don't necessarily have to have all of these things. But they would use it if they had it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's what makes them that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the other thing that, that, distinguishes fascism or is a fascistic thing is that basically the suppression of opposition or dissenting voices. Now you could see that from any perspective, anybody's going to say, Oh, we're being oppressed and blah, blah, blah. But that is a, a central tenet of, of fascism. 
That's it. YouTube is fascist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the point because a lot of people do tend to fly out the word fascist and it's not always accurate, but sometimes there are elements that could be considered fascist, essentially. But but in order to be fascist, essentially, there's two, two major... Well, there's several people who've defined it, but the two that we're going to look at is Jason Stanley and uh, um, Umberto Eco. Uh, now, Jason Stanley um, wrote the book, uh, what was it called? How to Spot Fascism, I believe. And he said that in order to make fascism worse, these are the three things that, oh, actually, there's more than three. Uh, but the three main ones are to create a mythic past, to attack the truth, and to sow division. So the first thing that fascists do is they create this idea of an idealized mythic past. So in Nazi Germany, it was the idea of Teutonic Knights and like, you know, traditionalism. And before all these Jews, when all the girls used to just go and sing on the mountains and blah, blah, blah with their plaits and we'd wear lederhosen and, and blah, blah, blah. Same thing with Make America Great Again. Like that is appealing to a mythic past that never existed. This idea of Americana, this idea again of the Blitz spirit, all of those those things that show people storming the beaches at Normandy and go, I didn't fight for this so that you could be a gay and stuff like that. Like that is distinctly fascist because it's appealing to a mythical past that never existed. Um, the second thing that they do is they rewrite reality with propaganda. Well, fake news that that's the thing or or like just look at the current state of the uk po- politicians where they just refuse to answer questions like or you know we're asked about failures and they keep talking about these 40 new hospitals that don't exist that is re- re- rewriting reality with propaganda you could also talk about like the british government and the american government just ignoring covid deaths currently and ignoring their their sort of role in the covid deaths they're rewriting reality with propaganda here's one see see if we if, if any of this uh, um uh, rings any bells fascists will reject and undermine trust in expertise education science and intellectuals Oh, that sounds like the past three years. Precisely. I mean, you could even re- say Michael Gove saying, we've had enough of experts. Yeah. Or you could all these people having a go at Fauci or having a go at the CDC or having a go at the, the World um, uh, Health Organization. It's the anti-vaxxers, the rejection of intellectuals, education and expertise is part of a fascist movement. Why do they do this? They do this to make you feel oppressed, to make you feel victimized, which we'll go into in a minute. They create a state of unreality. Here we go, where conspiracy replaces debate. That's GB News. That's talk radio. <laughs> Mm. That's Fox News. That's specifically yeah. Fox News under Roger Ailes, which we'll come on to in a little bit. But where conspiracy replaces debate, that that's Twitter. Okay, the, 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 the tropes of conspiracy, some of which we're going to come on to in a little bit, um, basically, that is an aspect of fascism. To create difference in groups to introduce hierarchies. Has anybody seen all this? I like the L's. I like the G's and the B's. I don't like the T's and the Q's and the pluses. Yeah. That's a fascist tactic. Right, okay. You know when you've got prominent gay novelty pop acts railing against drag queens, right? That is the very definition of creating difference in groups to introduce hierarchies. Oh, you you gays are all right, but those cross-dressers, we don't like them. We don't like them. You're all right. You'll help us persecute them. Now, here's the thing. You know, once that's done, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to go after you as well. They don't like you. They're using you. Basically, yeah. because the tactic is, if the gays who are deviant themselves think that transvestites and trans people are even more deviant than them, well, good God. And I'll tell you another example of that. All this just stop oil protesters. I've seen certain people going, good, smack the shit out of these, like, these, like, hippies, right? What are you doing to that? Right, okay. You're encouraging violence against protest. You're being manipulated. You're being yeah. told that this is going to be normalized. Normalization of violence against all protesters. But, but you've introduced that hierarchy immediately of what is a legitimate protest. 
You stoke feelings of victimhood in the group which is actually dominant. Okay, well, again, <laughs> white heterosexual males is the dominant group, right? Okay, white right-wing heterosexual males is the dominant group at the minute. And yet we're being told that Black Lives Matter and pride and drag stories and all of these things are an existential threat. Immigration, Muslims, all of that, it's, it's, it's an existential threat. Adverts with mixed-race couples, like, come on. Exactly. No, it's the thin end of the wedge, right? People have always said to me, all right, then, smart ass, how can we're allowed Mexican pride and gay pride and we're allowed, um, you know, black pride and stuff like that, but we're not allowed white pride? It's like, you know, you, you, know, you know, every day of the week is white pride. Like, well, yeah, it's because <laughs> the former, you know, gay pride, Mexican pride, black pride, they're talking about culture. And they're actually asking for acceptance into wider society. Whereas white pride is talking about genetics and it's preaching superiority. That's why you're not allowed white pride. But you know that, don't you? You know that. Like, yeah. so come on, stop it. Just stop it. It's just a stupid argument, of isn't it? Of course it, really? it is. Um, and here's, here's another thing that fascists do. See if you can um, see if this is ever been a thing suggests that men are threatened by gender equality <laughs> well yeah you know that's again it's almost ubiquitous between in in some of the alternative media this concept that basically like feminists radical feminists you radical blue-haired feminists demanding equality it's just going to destroy the nation again this comes from a fascist principle well, it's, it's the fall of rome Exactly. Why did Rome fall? Because of decadence, because of gays, which again is not true. It's nonsense. But again, that, that is the, the thing. So there's a concept called Ur fascism. Now, Umberto Eco, basically in, 90, in the 1990s, listed 14 common features of fascism. Right. Let's see if any of these sound familiar. It has a cult of tradition. So you could say it would reject Black Lives Matter, LGBT, abortion stuff like that seen any of that in the alternative media probably it rejects modernism so you could say it would be anti-vax uh, or anti-mrna or anti-experimental gene therapy it has action for action's sake so you know this constant 15 minutes cities agenda 30 this constant idea of railing against these existential threats going on twitter every day like james melville and going this is a problem this is a problem this is a problem this is a problem and this is also a tactic that's used by fox news which again we'll, we will come on to in a bit four disagreement is treason have you ever seen have you seen people rad, rad, rabid against david ike because he's pointed out that donald trump is shit <laughs> everybody like i'm telling you like this is the point that i could that i notice is you've got to go along with the party line if all of a sudden you say actually i, don't, I think that climate change might be a bad thing you're rejected by look at your thing Brent, like the second that you says, I don't actually agree with any of this anymore. It's like, well, you're evidently 77th Brigade, aren't you? Yeah. Like, because disagreement is treason. Like within fascism, fear of difference. So fear of refugees, fear of gay people, fear of Black Lives Matter, fear of drag artists. That's a fascist tenant. An appeal to social frustration. Wow. <laughs> so locked in. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, you will eat the bugs, you know, you will have to have an electric car, all of this. Here's one. Th this is a central tenet of fascism. Obsession with a world plot. Well, there you uh, go. Have we seen that anywhere, anywhere in the conspiracy world? Anything like the World Economic Forum, Agenda 30, the Trans Agenda, the New World Order, anything like that. The, the concept that the enemy is both strong and weak at the same time. So basically this this is particularly when you you think talking about things like the great replacement and um anti-immigration like these are a, a massive threat these, these are men of fighting age brent and they're they're going to kill us all except they're not quite strong enough to have a platform to refute any of this and 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 this is again a central tenet of, of fascism pacifism is trafficking with the enemy what are we involved in constantly a culture war a culture war 
like because passivism is trafficking with the enemy. So basically, that is a tenet of what we could be considered fascism. Contempt for the weak. We've all seen the pictures of Donald Trump done up as Rambo. Like, come on, it's ridiculous. And the multiple footage of uh, Biden or these people like tripping upstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The total morons, but they, they also rule the world. Well, exactly. Both weak and strong at the same time, uh, but but a contempt for the weak aspect of it. The idea that everybody is a hero and that everybody is part of of this this thing, which I suppose you could tie in with like the concepts of you know truth tellers or you know truth seekers or something like that. Digital soldiers. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Digital soldiers. There, um, you know, Q and honors, like you know. Um, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, the concept of machismo and weaponry. Uh, yep, there you go. Mm-hmm. They tend to like weapons. Andrew Tate, the manosphere, all of this um, alpha males, all of this ridiculous nonsense, which is based on the lie that wolves have alpha males in packs when actually they don't. Like, and also, you know, I'd like to think that perhaps we're a bit more sophisticated than wolves, <laughs> but you know, nope. who knows? Um, selective popularism which is basically you know what are we angry about today oh that is just twitter isn't it every day yeah you sheeple go and get your 17th booster i'm listening to tucker carlson so so there you go so that that would be the concept of fascism so let's take this just a step further is it fair is it fair to label any conspiracy theories as right wing far right or even fascist well well, let, let, let's have a look at some. Well, the, the, the first one that, that struck me is one that is ubiquitous within the um, conspiracy world. Um, it's promoted by David Icke. It's promoted by everybody, to be quite honest, everybody of any merit. And we've all heard it. Nathan Rothschild, through advanced knowledge of the result of the Battle of Waterloo, was able to make a fortune by the Bank of England and ever since then, the Rothschild family have financed ev- both sides of every war, including the Second World War. We've all heard this. All heard this. I've heard this one. I used to think that was absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. And we've also heard the phrase from Amishel Rothschild, let me make the money and I care not who makes the laws. The- these are the underpinnings of quite a lot. It's the underpinning of uh, the majority of David Icke's sort of hatred against the Rothschilds. Is it true? No, no, it's not true. It's just not true. Now, the the story is that Nathan Rothschild was specifically personally at the Battle of Waterloo. And seeing that Napoleon was about to be defeated, he hurried to Ostend and he paid to get a boat to the UK. And no one else could get, like, get, because there was a storm that prevented everybody else from getting there. So when he got to England, he said that Napoleon had won, and everybody panicked and sold all their shares and blah, 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 and he was able to buy it up extremely cheaply. Once the news came through that the English had actually won, the value of all these stocks went through the roof, and he was sufficiently rich that he got 20 million francs, and he was able to buy the Bank of England. That is is the story, okay? And um, in later versions, he, he wasn't actually there, he, or he was there and sent a courier pigeon, or just through the, the Rothschild's network of spies and bad bastards, they were able to sort of get this message back. So there's variations on, the, uh, on, the, um, on this. Do you know where this story came from? Oh, do tell. It came from a pamphlet that was released in 1846 by a bloke called Matthew George Denvale. Now, the reason that he wrote this, he wrote this pamphlet and he, it was attributed to Satan. So it's quite metal, right? <laughs> but its content is a bit, a bit black metal. Um, it basically, what had happened was there was a train that had derailed that was owned by um, Baron James de Rothschild and 57 people died and there was a lot of bad feeling towards that particular Rothschild. He hated Jews. He just hated Jews. He didn't like Jews. And so he saw this as an opportunity to spread this this lie about the Rothschild family. So he wrote this pamphlet called Sat- uh, uh, under the pseudonym, pseudonym Satan, in which this story appeared. And then this, the story was basically bounced about uh, through, through Europe until uh, the Nazis picked it up and they used that story in a film called De Rothschild, which is a propaganda film basically telling exactly the same story. <clears throat> 
Did they um, finance the Nazis? No. No, in fact, the Nazis stole all their money off of them. How did the, the, the Rothschild actually made money from the, the Battle of Waterloo by being able to finance Wellington? And they did this because through their banking uh, system, they were able to change the currency into local currency so he could spend it um, at Waterloo. Uh, so basically, that's why they, they did make some money off it, off it, but dozens of bankers made far more than them. And they certainly didn't make 20 million francs and they've never owned the Bank of England. And Amshel Rothschild never said that quote. So all of this came from either an anti-Semitic canard or Nazi propaganda film. That's, that's the source of it. And that gets shared every day. Every single day. That's the source of a lot of things, though. Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it, just? <laughs> That's what we're going like, to find out. <laughs> Well, let's look at like the concept of like the New World Order or a Jewish communist takeover. It's not new, the concept of poisoning the well, the concept of the blood libel. People have said this to me. There's even a meme that goes out and goes, all right, Neil, there's no smoke without fire. You say that the Jews aren't bad, but how come they've been persecuted by almost every single society throughout their their history up until the creation of the state of Israel? Um, how come everybody hates them? There's no smoke without fire. And it's like, it's actually relatively simple. If you think about who Jews were in the world, Jews were a nomadic tribe, essentially, or they, they, they the, the important point is Jews didn't have a homeland. In the same way that the, 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 the Roman gypsies or Slavs. So why is that easy to persecute them? Why is it easy to persecute Jews if they don't have a homeland? Because if they don't have a homeland, they don't have an army. And if they don't have an army, there's no one who's going to fight against you. I can't have a go at the French because sooner or later the French will invade. Right, I can have a go at Jews because there's no consequence to those those actions. Jo Jews have not got the platform to fight back, so that is why Jews have been basically smeared throughout history. Because everyone always needs a scapegoat, don't they? Really, so Precisely. I guess it's an easy scapegoat for dickheads. Yeah. So there's two conspiracy theories that could be considered completely far right. John Mappin of Turning Point UK. Now, what a lot of people don't realise about John Mappin, the Scientologist and QAnon promoter, is that he's the head of Turning Point UK in, um, in the UK. What is Turning Point? Turning Point is literally, literally, the propaganda arm of Coke Industries. Coke Industries is a right-wing industrialist connected to the Heritage Foundation and the Council for National Policy, evangelical Christian-based far right, connected to the anti-communist league, very, very nasty people. They've done more to sort of destroy workers' rights and to sow division uh, in the world than, than anybody. You could even make the argument that, that the Heritage Foundation, the CMP and organisations like that are the real deep state. Like, but and So anybody that promotes anything from John Mappin or Turning Point UK, you're dalliancing and you're dipping your toes in the far right. Um, Richie Allen. I like Richie Allen. Right. Okay. I've always got on with Richie. Okay. Although bizarrely, he's not had him on his show ever since I told him that COVID was real. But anyway, he hosts people like Mark Collette, um, of the BNP, um, on more than one occasion. You could make the argument that basically, um, you know, I'm just giving them, a, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I'd speak to anybody, but you are giving a platform to fascist, essentially. Mark Collette's girlfriend's got a swastika tattoo on her neck. He's a knobhead. Like, that's it. It's straightforward. You could even go so far as to say, I've been very disappointed to go on Richie Allen's website and looking at the references to all the stories that he promotes. They're all from the Telegraph or the Times. These are Tory donor right-wing publications, you're getting a very, very biased perspective, potentially not far right, but certainly right wing. Uh, so, and, and that can't be denied. David Icke's dalliance with Holocaust denial. Like, uh, and he never, he's never actually come out and said, yeah, the Holocaust is real, but he fucks about with that rhetoric. And I'll tell you for why, because he realizes that a, a large part of his audience um, believes that the Holocaust was fake and he doesn't want to alienate them. In the same way that when he was asked about Flat Earth, he said, well, it's all of realm, isn't it? Blah, 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 and all of this. It's like he doesn't want to alienate some people who are going to pay him money. 
that's 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 far right. They've also uh, Gareth is is um, mucked about with uh, with uh, mapping uh, as well, and has interviewed Tommy Robinson at least twice. Why would you interview Tommy Robinson? Like again, you can make the argument. Oh, we don't care. We'll we'll platform anybody. Fuck off. You you, don't, <laughs> you just simped to him. I watched that interview. You gave a platform to a dangerous con man, and you did it because you thought you could court his fans. Yeah. You, you did it to make money. You're a shit. That's the behaviour of a shit. So sorry, you're done. I used to work. I briefly worked for them. Like I'd have quit at that point personally. Like the the first time they had Tommy Robinson on, I'd have I'd have left. That'd have been it. We just walked out, yeah. Yeah, fuck that. You like absolutely no. The, you, you just don't promote that type of thing at all. It's ridiculous. The angle that they're putting it is like, well, he's never really, perhaps he, is he a racist or is he misunderstood? <laughs> As if he's never had the opportunity through the several books that he's written or the numerous television appearances that he's made to sell his to tell his side of the story. But that's the thing, though. It's this whole just asking questions to avoid yeah. the accountability of the people you're having on your shows. Exactly. Like, oh, well, I was just asking the question, you know? Yeah, absolutely. No, you're dead right. And this is the point. Like, you know, you, you, you they'll frame it like that. Oh, yeah, but you are. You're mucking about with the far right. And if you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. Um, Reclaim UK, UKIP, Brexit Party, all of that. Again, intimately connected with figures like Steve Bannon, who is, is basically admits to being far right. You know, um, Breitbart UK was set up specifically to promote UKIP. Specifically to promote UKIP. Right, okay. And, and all of these uh, basically work on a far right dalliancing into fascist uh, political movement. GB News is is actually financed by a think tank that's financed by the Koch brothers. Oh, well, there's only one of them left, but by Koch Industries. So the same thing. And basically that rat-a-tat-tat conspiratorial having Neil Oliver on, having, you know, they, they have Peter Sweden who's a, who's a Holocaust denier on. Like you cannot deny that they're like that they're right wing, even though they have a token black and a token gay person on to go. Oh no, we can't possibly be like. Oh come on, like it's like oh I can't be a serial killer because I've got living friends. Like <laughs> don't be ridiculous. It, it it just doesn't work like that. German new medicine. I was very disappointed to see this promoted by Richard D. Hall. German New Medicine is by Reich Gerd Harmer, and he's, this is the concept that basically all illness comes from trauma, um, and it's, um, it's, it's diseases and pathogens don't really work. You create the disease in your body by having a traumatic experience, and therefore disease can be cured by um, coming to terms with your thoughts and sort of you know, thinking yourself better, essentially. This is a David Oak one as well. It, does David Icke promoted this? Yeah, yeah, because you said like a disease is your body is diseased. Ah, yeah, he did. Yeah, wow. yeah, yes, I forgot I, he did that. I yeah. hate that wordage that people like it me so much. Mm. Now, do you want to know why he calls it? Why Riker Gerd Harmer calls it German New Medicine? It's not just because he's German. He wanted to make it distinct from Jewish medicine. Oh God. Jewish big pharma medicine. He 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 says that the only way you can catch cancer is by having a Jew inject it to you. God and sake. he postulates that no Jew in the history of the world has ever had cancer. Wow. But he made that distinction. He wanted to call it German because he, he thinks that the Jews are the scum of the earth. And the Germans were the opposite of the Jews. Jews are big pharma. So he does German new medicine. Nine out of ten people involved in that, promoting that, do not know that. Isn't it ridiculous? Wow. But I think we could say that was probably erring on far right. <laughs> um, QAnon, the American patriot movement, we all saw the tiki torches and people saying Jews will not replace us. Like there is a, a massive burgeoning of the far right in America. Cambridge Analytica, which is one of my favourite subjects, the Mercers, Steve Bannon, the CNP. Steve Bannon spent a long time trying to cultivate the far right in Europe through Salvini, Le Pen, Gert Wilders, the Golden Dawn, Victor Orban, literally trying to, to, to re-burgeon a far right collective movement in Europe. 
Okay, so anybody that basically bought into any of the nonsense from Cambridge Analytica or anything from Breitbart, you connected to that nexus, who are trying to start what he calls a movement of like-minded far-right political parties. So I think, again, we could say that there's an element of far-right there. Um, COVID denial and COVID downplaying. Well, basically, all the anti-lockdown stuff was done by the Heritage Foundation in the UK. The um, um, the anti-lockdown protests were arranged by the Church of Scientology along with the English Democrats, who are a specifically racist party. Um, there was the rise of the white dragons. The interesting thing through COVID, and again, uh, listen to our herd immunity documentary, explains all the downplaying of, of COVID actually came from the government itself. Sergru Communications, which is uh, a think tank connected to, uh, connected to the Nudge unit, was the government. The government basically, Sergru Communications were the people that poured scorn on the lockdown and wanted uh, herd immunity to happen. Uh, Economic Insight was a think tank connected to the Treasury. They put out the idea that the lockdown caused more deaths than COVID itself. They're government entities. The government basically also financed Carol Sikora, Sunita Gupta, Carl Hennigan, and various other doctors to, a pro- to, to go for herd immunity. The Telegraph also promoted herd immunity. Now, everyone is wetting their fucking knickers about this exclusive by the Telegraph that the government actually spied on these anti-lockdown herd immunity, blah, blah, blahs to try and like, and everyone's got to see, I told you, it's like, we knew about this. This was public knowledge. They didn't listen to them. What happened was they still had Carl Hennigan and, um, and this Tegnell and Sunitra Gupta into number 10 in September of 2021 and they advised against a lockdown. What actually came out from that, that story is that SAGE, were comp- the, the, the advisory body, the scientific advisory body, were completely ignored all the way through the lockdown. You know who was listened to by the UK government? Their donors, their donors who own the Telegraph, the Times, the Express, the Daily Mail, spiked online, lockdown skeptics, together declaration, us and them, PCR claims, Spectator, Sky News, Tucker Carlson. All of those people spread anti-lockdown, COVID denial stuff that was all repeated completely verbatim by the alternative media. All of those people are connected to the government. That was the government basically saying, oh, if we promote all this distrust in ourselves, essentially we don't have to pay for anything. Is that, that, that uh, and again, that fits many of the tenets of fascism. So Holocaust denial, just Holocaust denial in general, like the greatest story never told. Nick Collistrom, I quite like Nick. I've met him a couple of times. He's very befuddled, but relatively pleasant guy but he's got some horrible views on the holocaust absolutely horrible and and to suggest that that's anything other than far right i I, you can't make that argument basically um going further than that this concept that everything is marxism or cultural marxism that is a, a specifically a nazi Uh, propaganda program it used to be called um, cultural bolshevism and then in the 80s the term cultural marxism was invented by nazi loving paul wayrich of guess which think tank the council for national policy and the heritage foundation he's basically friends with laszlo pastor who's a nazi collaborist and a member of the world anti-communist league which was a, a legitimately nazi organization that basically created death squads in south america So anybody promoting this, everything is Marxism. Wokeism is Marxism. No, it isn't. No, it isn't at all. Okay, you're just going for an old Nazi anti-Semitic canard there, I'm afraid. Um, Anybody that basically talks about the Great Replacement or Kalergi or any of this nonsense, you've fallen for far-right propaganda. None of it's true. Go and listen to our Cultural Marxism um, uh, uh, podcast to find out the the origins of this. Um, The Voltaire quote that's always thrown about, if you want to to learn who rules over you, simply find out who you are not allowed to criticise. And they mean Jews. Like, let's be honest, when they use that phrase, they're talking about Jews. It's often used in, in, in... uh, 
when talking about Israel, the state of Israel, and I have to say I completely disagree with Israel's foreign policy, but there is a difference between being an anti-Semite and disagreeing with with Israel's foreign policy. I disagree with the UK's foreign policy. Like, but but there are completely separate things. But anyway, to learn who rules over you, you simply find out who you're not allowed to criticise was not Voltaire. It was actually um, a quote, from a neo-Nazi paedophile called Kevin Strom, who in 1993 wrote an essay with this this in, and it was later attributed to Voltaire. Um, Pretty sure Musk yeah. retweeted that one too. Exactly, exactly. Elon Musk re- repeated it, and it's just it's just absolutely crazy to be quite honest. But you know what 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 are you going to do? It's uh, it's it, it's ridiculous. So. The the final thing that I just want to talk talk about, okay, it's is yeah. So basically, we could see that there is a lot of conspiracy theories that you could say are far right or have got an origin in the far right or have been sort of infiltrated by the far right, so to speak. Doesn't mean that all uh, all conspiracy theories are even aware of this, um, and it doesn't mean that all conspiracies are are far right or Nazi. However, there is another thing. And this is something that people really aren't going to like. I We both recently watched a really fabulous documentary called um, The Brainwashing of My Dad, or Brainwashing My Dad. And this talks about how Roger Ailes, who was um, an executive at Fox, changed the, the format in order to basically promote John Birch Society and Tea Party, which are these far-right, fundamentalist Christian think tanks and groups with political ideologies that basically is is traditional right-wing Christian, anti-abortion, anti-homosexuality, anti-foreigners, anti-everybody that isn't a rich white person, basically. And they decided that that Roger Ailes, in order to increase the, um, the, the sort of the demographic watching and also to sort of like make the demographic far more loyal to Fox News he radicalized viewers by making them angry. Now, what he decided to do was we'll, we'll have opinion pieces, we'll be low on facts, we'll be high on emotion, and the constant story is there is an existential threat to your life that is going to alter your life and there's nothing that you can do about it. So it's stuff like cross-dressing Black people from across the border are coming into your life to force you to be gay and give up your mortgage or something stupid like that. Right? Okay, it's proper Daily Mail stuff. Like, brr, brr, brr. everybody's terrified all the time, makes them angry, um, and there's nothing you can do about it. And the thing that struck me watching this documentary was that's exactly what's going on in the alternative media nowadays. Mm. If you go on Twitter and you look at, I don't know, the Freds or Leilani or James Melville or any of these people's like yeah, yeah. Um, Twitter feeds, it's constant anger. It's constant rage. It's constant. This is a threat to our life. We need to, we need to stop it. Why does this work? Right, it works on two ways. One, it creates a dopamine response, making yourself angry your brain releases all these chemicals to calm you down. And so in the same way as like drugs or gambling or whatever gives you a dopamine response, getting angry gives you a dopamine response. So it can become addictive. The other thing is it positions you with like-minded people. If you're shouting and angry and everyone goes, you're damn right. Well, you know, you're, you're supported by people that all agree with you. And one, that's really psychologically comforting. It basically tells you where where your place is in the world and how the world is and that you've got the answers. And two, it allows to position yourself as a hero fighting against horrible bad things Mm -hmm. um, in in, in your mind. It stops people challenging the status quo, you know, so nothing gets better. Yeah. We'll stay in the cycle of anger and, you know. Yeah, for two two reasons, which – Brilliantly astute there, Sam. Like, one, it's an echo chamber. So basically, you never expand out of that echo chamber. And anybody that basically points that you're an echo chamber, you can dismiss them immediately. In the same way that basically you go, no, that's not true, mate. Here's something from AP. Here's a fact check. A fact check? The BBC? The Guardian? It's like, well, why not just, like, look at the source and see if you'd like... But but do you know what I mean? That immediate rejection, which is commonplace within the, the conspiracy world, if the 
that's why the pandemic was a thing. Well, the the news says that there's a um, there's there's a deadly virus out there, so the opposite must be true. And it's like, right, okay. Well, let's have a look at some of the popular conspiracies at the minute and see if they fit into this idea of making people angry or even into the concept of right-wing political movements. Well, let's just have a look and see which there are. So there's some that basically are obviously politically right-wing. Brexit, QAnon, Clinton murder list, Hunter Biden's laptop, Pizzagate, Wiener's laptop, Frazzle Drip, 2,000 mules and voter fraud, anything that's anti-trans, anything that's anti-LGBT, anything that talks about um, attacking religion or homeschooling or anything like that, that is all specifically right-wing and all designed to make you furious. You've got stuff that's just there to make you outraged, like someone is controlling your life. So that's forced vaccines, lockdowns, World Economic Forum, 15-minute cities, Agenda 21, immigrants are the army. You've got conspiracy theories that just so happen, by strange coincidence, to favour the oil industry, which is climate change is fake, the green agenda is run by a shadowy elite, they're going to tax the air that you breathe, they're going to make you eat bugs, all of this. And then you've got conspiracy theories that just so happen to favour right-wing Christian think tanks. So you've got the Great Replacement gun control, government overreach, free speech is being threatened, stuff like that. Now, what's important about all of these conspiracy theories, which I think we could safely say all sort of fit a certain right-wing pattern? Well, the other reason that they they fit a right-wing pattern is because it doesn't have to make sense. It just has to make you feel angry Mm. and threatened Mm -hmm. so that you're you're the victim. There we go. The most irrational, so... Precisely. But this is, uh, sorry, to go back to your second point, um, uh, uh, outside of the the, um, echo chamber, when you're angry, you don't make good decisions. You don't think clearly. So you look to whoever started this rumor for answers, which just perpetuates that echo chamber, right? So my theory on this, and they're not going to like this, but these think tanks, the Heritage Foundation, the CMP, uh, the IEA, who basically finance quite a lot of these people, Turning Point UK, who finance a lot of these people, they looked at the alternative media conspiracy crowd as a ready-made demographic that could be manipulated and exploited using exactly the same tactics as Fox News. They appeal to emotion, they're short on detail, and they make you feel attacked, like you're being victimized by an existential threat that you have no control about. And then you combine this with the use of the medium of social media and the immediate need for answers and the echo chambers that they promote, and then you have it. Basically, Twitter makes... When you're in a Twitter argument... It makes you feel like everybody in the world is having that same argument because you're right in it. And you can't see that nobody in the world's talking about that. At the minute, they're talking about these 10,000 pictures of, of Hunter Biden <laughs> yeah. and how it's a massive, massive thing. And it's like, I've seen these pictures ages ago. So it, it's just not. But in that echo chamber, everybody's like, I can't understand why nothing's being done about this because it gives you the impression that the world is much, much smaller. Like, So basically, the audience gets addicted to the anger. They get addicted to the community. And they they get addicted to the the fun of finding stuff out. And once the the conspiracy crowd gets addicted to the anger, they basically also get a sense of purpose and meaning. And it all just sort of snowballs, basically. Now, this also explains the recent popularity of GB News, Talk Radio, Tucker Carlson, Reclaim, Brexit Party, and all these right-wing figures, why they resonate so well with the conspiracy crowd and the alternative media, because it's the same tactics. So it's exactly the same thing that's recognized. Also, the source of a lot of these conspiracy theories are these same right-wingers, I'm afraid. So the irony of this is that these far-right think tanks have essentially, and I'm going to choose my words very, very carefully here, brainwashed the conspiracy theory crowd into doing the bidding of rich elitists. So you know that conspiracy, that conspiracy theorists are used to spread conspiracies? That's what's actually happening. Mm, Yeah. And it's all coming from right-wing think tanks. So is it fair... Is it fair to label certain conspiracy theorists as far right? Yeah, yeah, it is. It absolutely is. Do a lot of them realize this? No, 
No, I don't think they do. I, and I don't think it makes them bad people necessarily, but I do think that a lot of them have been very, very badly tricked. I think a lot of them started as like old school leftists, like in the hippie and the wellness community, and they still see themselves there. They don't yes. think that they think that everyone else has shifted left and they've stayed exactly where they were because yeah. they don't realize that they've just been slowly breadcrumbed these tiny little pieces of conspiracy from, you know, their anti-vaccine stance, which they had when they were left wing. They've been fed all these conspiracy theories and now they still believe they're in the same spot, but they just believe these radical anti-Semitic, you know, often starting from Nazi propaganda, conspiracist theories. Um, so I think it's definitely fair that, to call them far right. Absolutely. And, and then you've got the sort of like conservatism is the new punk, the woke mind virus. <laughs> or I didn't leave the left, the left left me. Yeah. All of that. And if you actually look at it, it's not the case. It, it, the, the case is that traditionally there's always been a right wing bent within um, conspiracy theories, as, as you pointed out, that the original sort of Illuminati things, your anti sort of Jewish New World Order conspiracy theories, your John Birch Society and stuff like that. But then again, there's always been left wing stuff as well. And it just seems that basically the left wing is now being associated with the woke vi mind virus and uh, decadence and stuff in a way that is very, very um, similar to fascist rhetoric and far-right rhetoric. And the reason is because it's coming from there. I find the irony, though, that it's from the crowd that says, question everything. Yeah. They don't actually question the stuff that they're pursuing and believing themselves. Yeah. And, and again, what happened to all this, like, you know, universal love is the only truth and all of that. And now all of a sudden, no, no, we, we actively hate these people because they're coming for our children or they're men of fighting age or they're there to, um, you know, to destroy the fabric of society. And the language being used is very reminiscent of language that was used in the 1930s. And, you know, you are seeing again, the rise of far right political movements and stuff like that. And I think that the danger is that a lot of it is being normalized is being, being because of the way that it does again position you as the hero and everybody is the hero but also in the same time you're being victimized it's being slowly normalized and some behavior and attitudes that a few years ago wouldn't be entertained by alternative media are now becoming the norm which is a shame we have card carrying nazis marching through the streets of cities here at the moment and yeah. you see the rhetoric on these online conspiracy groups that i mean like these are nazis that have been out and out nazis for like near 10 years you know and mm -hmm. it's a psyop apparently you know in all these yeah, yeah. groups it's a government psyop you know yeah but this is this is exactly the point of the show that they're appealing to sometimes legitimate you know it's legitimate to be um wary of government overreach it's legitimate to be uh, wary of of lobbyists and, and corporations and stuff like that, but they're, they're taking those those legitimate um, concerns and they're mashing them together with other things to give a worldview that is isn't accurate, basically. Yes, yeah, fantastic. Um, I hope that this gives the conspiracists a few things to think about because these were a lot of things that I didn't understand myself. You know, I always say I think if I had known more maybe i wouldn't have gone so far down the rabbit hole you know if i had known i'd been manipulated or that some of this stuff was being presented like unfairly you know so i, I hope some people will take this and go do their own research now after this and look into what's been said you know just contemplate ask the question of like who's telling me this stuff and why are they telling me this you know it just Go do your research. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Sam. Yeah, nice one, Sam. That was really good, mate. Really, really, really insightful, actually. They, they, yeah, spot on. Yeah, pleasure. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Nice one. Thank you for listening to Some Dare Call It Conspiracy, the political spectrum of conspiracy theories. Follow us on Twitter, at Some Dare Podcast, for all the latest from us. And if you want to support us, please consider joining us on patreon.com slash some dare call it conspiracy. 
You'll be able to get early access to episodes, including each full deep dive series on day one, and exclusive Patreon-only episodes. When you subscribe to our initiate tier for a fiver, or our handler tier for a tenner, you'll get a welcome pack of four of Neil's books, eight of my albums and EPs, and a PDF of Headache Comics 4, courtesy of Nicholas C. Gray. And to our first Patreons, Adam, Rachel, Mark, Brian, Wayne, Emma, John, thank you so much for your support from the both of us at Some Dare Call It Conspiracy. Conspiracy.